I am muted. Yeah, sorry. I thought that was on me. Holy cow, I was freaking out. Great start. Great start to the show. Well, it's December 30th. We weren't expecting to be here, but welcome to a special edition of Chatterbox Res presented by DSC Commodities. Joined by my guy Clay Stone. We'll get to him in just a second as the Reds make another splash this offseason, signing right-handed pitcher Frankie Montas. We'll talk all about him. We'll also talk about the other signing of the week, Buck Farmer returning. Uh, but first, a quick word about our presenting sponsor, DSC Commodities. DSC is a leader in renewable commodities for biofuel production, specializing in used cooking oil collection, aggregation, and sales. Visit www.deepsouthcommodities.com for more information. Thanks, as always, to our friends at DSC. All right, I got my guy, Clay Snowden. We're here to talk a little Reds baseball on December 30th. We didn't think we were going to be here. We thought we did our last show of the year, but uh, uh, Nick Kroll and company has other plans. Clay, how you doing? I'm doing great. I uh, The news broke. I was able to get an article out. Then I went to the movies with, with my wife, and now I'm here with you. Yeah, well. No place I'd rather be here than with you, Mr. Snowden. All right, well, um, did this move surprise you? It, it surprised me. I, I thought I wasn't expecting a deal, at least until, you know, maybe in a week or two into January, if the Reds were going to make another deal. Um, I was not at all expecting this on a Saturday afternoon when I got a first text coming through from our guy, Craig Sandlin. Uh, this one surprised you today? The timing did not necessarily surprise me, but the move itself did. And it just goes to show like how many, you know, Twitter people have been tweeting out sources that did not end up doing anything. And we never once heard this name connected with the Reds, really. And here it is, Frankie Montas on a one year deal. So yeah, I mean, I, I liked it. Like I said, the the timing itself wasn't exactly surprising, but the the move was a bit surprising. Yeah, and if you're not aware, one year, $16 million was the, uh, I believe, the, the final tally. Uh, obviously, a high price for a guy that threw uh, uh, an inning in a third all of last season coming off of uh, shoulder surgery. But, uh, Clay, if anything, I think this speaks to kind of where the starting pitching market is. Yeah, exactly. And I thought deals like this for, you know, higher upside type arms, you know, people who want to kind of classify this as a prove a deal type, the Reds were going to have to pay a little bit more than other teams in my, in my estimation for it. So I, I don't care about the money, even if it was one year, 20 million, like I feel the exact same way with it right now. I really wish there would have been a team option year on there. Uh, I really would have loved the team option on this deal, but I'm not going to complain too much about it. Um, you mentioned Montas, you know, it's coming off of a shoulder injury. And that's the one thing that that's really scaring me here. It, it scares me in the sense of, of him. Uh, I guess, it, you know, I, I assume the Reds have done their due diligence. They feel uh, fairly confident that, that he's going to be able to contribute at a decent amount in 2024. Uh is Frankie Montas going to make 25 starts or is Frankie Montas going to be the next Ryan Madsen and uh sign a deal and, and never pitch. And honestly, I don't, I don't mind risks like this. Uh, I I've been saying all off season, I don't mind the one year risks. Those are the risks. That I think that the Reds should be taking, um, especially with the, the high upside that you have with, with Montas. I mean, this is a guy that finished sixth in the Cy Young voting in 2021. This is a guy that, uh, when him and Luis Castillo were the sought-after free agents at the 2022 deadline, they were 1A and 1B. I mean, that was that was the caliber of pitcher that, that he was viewed at, and that was not all that long ago. So these are the kind of risks I want the Reds to make, in, not the risks of eight years for a starting pitcher at $190 million that uh, if, if it goes south after two years, you're stuck for five more years of, of a guy. That can kind of cripple a small market like the Reds. This, if he never pitches for the Reds, this does absolutely nothing to change the trajectory of of the team. But it gives the Reds another quality arm um, that has the upside to be a top of the rotation if big if things go right. Yeah, and 
Yeah, I'm probably a little bit lower on Montas than that the average MLB fan, and um, that's fine, you know, whatever. Like, at the end of the day, the Reds got better today. They're a better team today than they were yesterday. And if their strategy is let's get a lot of starting pitchers who are, you know, good, solid starting pitchers, and, you know, some of them have injury risk. But if you can kind of play it to a point where you just need a total amount of innings. So if it's 12 guys – or eight guys, or whatever the number is that fills those innings, that's fine. Um, I probably overblow the home and away splits for him. I know that's not everything, but you know he was pitching in a pitcher friendly park in Oakland. I know the XERA shows that it's, it's closer than the actual ERA starts. Uh, the reason I wanted to point that out is maybe you know he's not the three six ERA or whatever the number is or three seven. Maybe he's closer to a four in Great American Ballpark. Um, being his home park or a four two even, but he, it, you know, if that's your number three pitcher, like I'm okay with that. My primary concern with this signing, like I said, was the injuries. Just to give you an idea, it's it's not even a oh injury. That's it. It's a shoulder specific injury. I did a little bit of research on shoulder injuries before we hopped on here from 2023, and the list is not good when it comes to pitchers. Um, Soroka, Kyle Wright. Aaron Ashby, Nestor Cortez had that shoulder injury, never came back. Steven Strasburg never recovered from it. Woodruff, uh, just in the red system, Bryce Bonin, and, you know, we all know Suarez and Votto were dealing with shoulder injuries. Not a pitcher, though. Uh, Steve Hadger, they had recently traded. And Justin Dunn. Justin Dunn was dealing with that shoulder, and we never really saw anything of him. So for spe- specific shoulder injuries with pitchers always scare me more than – other injuries with pitchers. But like you said, the Reds made a risk here that is a low risk move. If he doesn't even pitch, it's just the money. Now, you know, you can talk opportunity costs, right? Which is why some people are mad out there. And I understand that. There's no reason. You know, I, I wanted a really high level pitcher. As a fan, I wanted the highest level pitcher that we can go out, even if we traded for him or signed him or whatever. And I wanted those innings to be used on a high level guy, maybe even more of a, you know, track record of health. But at the end of the day, this is may just be what the market was offering. We don't know what trades were available. We don't know what other pitchers wanted. Um, A a comparison I immediately thought of was Jack Flaherty, who signed with the Tigers one year, 14 million. Would you rather have Montas or Flaherty? I'd rather have Montas. That now it's a $2 million difference there. But give me Frankie Montas way. I, I'd pay $5 million more for Frankie Montas, um, you know, if both are healthy, that is, you know, in, ter- in terms of their actual um, on-field performance. It's that injury that we just do not know. Now, he did come back and pitch that one inning, 1.1 innings at the end of the year. Velocity, of course, was a little bit down. Like, what, what would you expect? But um, really, really interested to see what he – looks like in spring training because if he is healthy nick like i'm going to be a lot more excited about this and you know tech technically does not pull the reds out of going out and adding another even higher level guy it doesn't eliminate them from that even though it is less likely now yeah i got a couple notes here that i i uh <laughs> it's my, my son snuck in on the background here um uh, aaron boone take it forever it's worth he was the pr guy basically for for Montas coming back last year, um, his, 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 his rotator cuff was left alone. Uh, so that's definitely um, a good sign. Uh, also, a note from Eno Saris uh, said it was a good sign that he came back and threw the ball hard. Um, he actually did throw 95-6 in that, that inning, um, just down about a half tick. Um, and that's in short stints, the reliever, but his sinker had better shape and his slider speed was present. So uh, that was uh, okay. good to see. Um. <laughs> yeah, they, there is one thing about him that is interesting. I know other people have pointed this out as well, but the one pitch that he has that I'm super intrigued by is the split finger. And these are 2022 numbers. I'm throwing out that 1.1 innings in 2023 when it comes to data. It, does, it doesn't make sense besides what Nick mentioned on the fastball velocity. 2022, the split finger, he threw it 
25% of the time held batters to a 177 average with a 280 slug and a, a expecting slug 280 as well. 2021, that split finger is 22% of the time with a 126 average. But the main thing here are the whiffs. Uh, in 2021, the whiff percentage was 51%. 2022, 36%. I'm working off a sheet here is why I keep keep looking down there. I'm kind of old school tonight. But that split finger is something that we've seen the Reds kind of like to get some, some pitchers in with. And it's a lethal pitch. I was watching some of it before we got on tonight. And it has some crazy movement. But, yeah, if they can, you know, maybe they see some, something with – he's a true five-pick pitch pitcher. So maybe they see something that they can tinker with in terms of wh what pitchers are used at what percentage. And, you know, I, I like that he has a lot of pitches that he can throw. And he really used all of them as a put-away pitch, which is kind of the pitch you go to and you want to strike somebody out. Um, they were all above 12% and none above 23%. So you don't really know what's coming with two strikes, which is also something that I like in a pitcher. Yeah. One of the things I haven't I haven't really saw noted from, from anything that I've read today is one thing worth mentioning, I guess, on the negative side with Montas, he did have an 80 game PED suspension back in, yeah. in twenty in twenty nineteen. I had completely forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Uh everything pre twenty twenty feels like it's so far away. And that's why he didn't pitch much in those years leading up to twenty twenty one. You know, you had COVID, you had the suspension, you had his rookie year in seventeen, I think. Um and then he came in and pitched, you know, a healthy amount of innings, then was injured. The one thing that I did notice is he can give up some home runs. Um, 2022, is he was right at about 13% home run rate. So to compare that to somebody, Hunter Green was 14% home run rate. But, Nick, I went back and watched all those home runs from 2022. And the funny thing about it is, all of them. The majority of them were like home run hitters. Here's the list. Vlad, Otani twice, Arenado, Julio Rodriguez, Kyle Tucker, Sal Salvador Perez, Schwarber, Jose Ramirez, Andre Jimenez, and then Marwin Gonzalez and Luis Renjifro. Like, there were some big bats in there that, like, you're just going to give up home runs to those guys. There's a reason they hit 40 a year. But Marwin Gonzalez took one, like, I mean, it was just right down the middle. He cranked it. It was awesome. One thing you said earlier, and I do think it's worth noting, is uh, I expect the Reds did have to overpay for, for Montas. Um, if you're Frankie Montas, um, and uh, if you had a deal uh, to pitch, I don't know, maybe in Kansas City uh, for 3 or $4 million less, I would almost think you might be more inclined to take that just being it's a better ballpark. It's it's hard to establish your value at Great America Ballpark. So the Reds did probably have to pay a little more, and that's part of the 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 price you pay with JBP. Of course, you get it on the flip side with a lot of hitters um, where, where you make a lot of that up. The home and road, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's worth noting. I mean, I think it's, it, it's so up and down, and, and there's so much small sample and all that kind of stuff. Um, also worth noting, like not a lot of pitchers pitch well at great on the road in general. Most pitchers do perform better in their home ballpark um, across baseball outside of the Reds. Like Hunter Green yeah, doesn't pitch Tyler well at Great American Ballpark. Graham Ashcraft doesn't pitch well at Great American Ballpark. The Graham Ashcraft's got an ERA in his career over five at GABP. So, um, I mean, again, you're going to after starts are going to be on the road. I, I don't, I, I think it's, it's maybe there's some, some reason for concern, but, I don't know if I would necessarily be like, oh, but this guy has huge splits. It really is going to, you know, really turn me one way or the other on a guy. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really like um, in 2022, he had like a 236 ERA in Oakland and, you know, closer to a five away from Oakland. Um, but that that's natural. Like you can take a bad pitcher and put him in Oakland. He's going to have a much better ERA typically. Right. Um, but you're talking about the market and I the market and the value that they get will tell you what the league thinks of them as a pitcher more times than not, right? What Because somebody, if they really thought, man, Frankie Montas is going to be the ace of our staff, like somebody would have given him more money. And I'm not here to, you know, poop on the parade or whatever. I'm just saying, keep in mind, the injury 
and what he's coming off of, a lot of teams were not willing to go more than 16. I mean, you're getting guys like Lucas Giolito, who just came in short of 20 on a two-year deal. So I think it is a little bit of a risky move in terms of he may not pitch, you know, what does this stop adding elsewhere? Like, you know, opportunity costs, what I mentioned earlier, if you spent 16 million here, you can't spend 16 million elsewhere. Potentially, you know, they could, they could, because there's not a salary cap. It doesn't matter as much. Right. Um, So that I'm just saying, you know, I think Montas can, can absolutely be like the number three pitcher best case, absolute best case scenario come in and be like, a number two type pitcher. Um, But he didn't get paid like that. He didn't get the deal like that. So the league is not viewing him in that way this off season. Now the Reds probably had to give him a little bit more money, even though his value matched up with some other projections I did see. Um, But yeah, the, the, the prove a deal in great American ballpark, there's a reason you don't see it too often. It's because most pitchers don't want to come here to prove it. Um, so I think he probably got a little bit more money. If I if I just had a guess, this is just simply my own guess. It was probably teams were willing to give him twelve, maybe twelve twelve million to come in on a one year deal. Um, that's why I was hoping the Reds would get that option here. Hey man, we'll give you the, the sixteen, give us the option, but it didn't work out that way. Well, maybe the team option is also part of uh, uh, the Great America Ballpark price. For he's like. Outside for one year, but I, I don't want to be committed, you know, to, to, if I'm having to reestablish my value over two years um, in, in a ballpark, like I might get and say, hey, I don't, I don't like bitching here. Uh, um, so that 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 might be as well. I, I think probably the thing people are more interested in at this point is, is kind of what does this mean? What does this mean for, you know, the Reds and, and their pitching overall? Before we get to that, Clay, I did want to kind of ask you, as I kind of dug through a little bit more and, and kind of, you know, put a, a mock depth chart of the Reds overall pitching, I wonder if the Reds were looking, hey, we want to add one more starter, but kind of looking at what we have, we have a lot of internal options. We have a lot of guys that we like. We're not going to go out and add like a, an Eric Lauer or a James Paxson as a last filler. We're going to take a shot at a higher upside guy because we'd ra- we don't want to replace we don't want to replace Connor Phillips in the rotation with a guy that's probably not as good or we're hoping he's not as good at, at least if if Mo- maybe Montas never pitches for us maybe he can't stay healthy but if Montas is pitching we feel pretty confident that he's going to be good you think maybe there's any truth to that yeah and you know look looking at the list on the screen like Lodolo's up there Montas is up there, like, you know, both guys who had struggled with injuries all of last year. Like, it's just hard to say for sure what you will get this year. Brandon Phillips, or Brandon Phillips, my gosh, Brandon Williamson right now is depth. That's a guy who started a bunch of games and pitched well at times. Connor Phillips, high upside prospect, saw him flash in a moment or two uh, towards the end of the year. Carson Spears, like, Red loud, louder first round draft pick. Like this is good quality depth. They do not need, in my opinion, another uh, you know guy to come in and pitch to close to five ERA and just eat some innings. I don't see that because I think all of these younger guys are stepped forward from where they were last year. Last year we wanted that, right? We would take anyone who could start. Like Ben Lively was huge because he came up and gave legit innings at times. Um, I don't think that they need that as much right now. Now, does that mean that they could, you know, theoretically trade one of these guys in a package to land a higher upside pitcher? Like, yeah, that's still possible. That's what you get when you create depth and you sign Montas. It can bump everybody down below him, right? So trading from there makes it a little bit easier if they wish to do that. Yeah. But I, I don't think and they will. Like, look, look around at what these pitchers are getting on the open market, like, Man, it makes it less and less likely that I want to trade some of these guys with this much control if Lucas Giolito is getting two years, $38 million coming off of two terrible seasons. Yeah, I mean, d- definitely. I think that that it, it, it makes the, the importance of growing your own pitchers even more important, right? Um, 
you know, as you, uh, as you kind of look, look through these, these deals, um, I put this together. I know a lot of people are like, Oh, Brandon Williams, is, I, it, Brandon Williams probably ends up in the starting rotation on opening day. Your chances of Nick Lodolo, Frankie Montas, and even like Hunter green, all yeah. three of those guys being healthy at the end of spring training is probably not all that high. So he probably finds a way to get in there. Fills fills the spot of one of the injured guys. Um, I love Connor Phillips, but I have no problem if he has to start the year at at uh, at Triple A. Um, I, I think it's exciting that man. You're going to look at a Triple A rotation, and it's going to actually have some quality pitchers. Whereas last year, I, I don't know. You know, I know Clay, your guy who likes to watch minor league games. You didn't need to watch the the Reds minor league. Uh, uh, pitching side of, of of the of the games, you just need to watch whoever was flying through the system at that point. Uh, there was a lot of 14, 12 games in AAA last year. Yeah. I don't think you're going to have the case at least in that th- this year. Yeah, the rotation should be strong, and it's not out of the question that. Um, yeah, I think Liam R- R- Richardson could be a great bullpen piece. Yeah, and it's not out of the question that they sit here and say. You know, Ty Floyd's not too far away. Rhett Louder's coming up. You know, you got Spears as depth right now. Phillips Williamson, you know, we know all the names. Like, if they even wanted to transition him at some point this year to see if he could be bullpen depth for this season, I I, I don't think that's out of the question either. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Lion Richardson, you know, great potential bullpen piece. Carson Spires is kind of that. I think could be a nice little hybrid guy that that you can he Carson Spires kind of feels like and, and no disrespect to Carson Spires I like what he did last year feel like the perfect four A pitcher that can kind of come come back and forth could could go in the bullpen for a little bit um, I like that and I think Rhett Lauder is going to be here quicker than than we might think and then of course Nick Martinez was everyone said he's getting starter money and uh, uh, I think now I think you're probably like okay yeah he's probably not in the starting rotation but. He's still another starting pitching option. It's just it's exciting that there's so many guys here. Um, but again, you could have a rash of injuries, and all of a sudden your depth of looking like, hey, we have eight, nine guys we like as starters could be down to five very, very quick. Yeah, and Martinez, you know, you pay him because he's able to do something that few pitchers can do, and that's bounce to and from the rotation without like you know, months of build up and all this stuff. He's proven that he can do this role that's kind of unique and rare and becoming more common in this day and age. You kind of want one of those type of guys, and he's the guy that they landed on there. Um, you know, Buck Farmer's back. I think that that's a useful guy to have in the bullpen. I don't want him out there in the eighth and ninth inning every night or anything, but you're going to need to get through some games. So overall, like I, I look at this list here and, I like it. Even when you look at the other pitchers, like TJ Antone, man, I just wish he could be healthy and we could just see what that looks like. But, you know, you can look at those other names and make a case for several of them. There's a few others that I'm, I'd be willing to, uh, you know, move on from without any issue. If someone gets DFA'd for a a bigger signing or something like that. All right. We got a super chat here from uh, uh, Sean. Sean says signing a pitcher with an injury history, to join a rotation with the same problem seems counterproductive. Yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying there. I know a lot of people wanted that 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 guy. I just, I'm not sure there's that many guys across baseball that are these surefire um, 150 inning guys that are going to be quality. On yeah. top of that, uh, especially without signing them to an eight year, you know, 175 million dollar deal. Um, I 100% am on the side of throw, take a shot with Frankie Montas versus blowing up your, your farm system for, uh, like a guy like Dylan Cease. Frankie Montas could be better than Dylan Cease. Will he? I, probably not, but there's a potential. So you have the potential of, uh, of that. And you didn't give up anything for him. Like, this is the kind of thing, like the Reds put so much stock into this plan of, building a pipeline, building from within. I think it would have been cheapening it to just, all right, first time we have a chance to win, let's trade these prospects and, and uh, um, um, get a, a, get some more established major league talent as opposed to just signing guys with money. 
Um, and uh, we'll see. I mean, again, Frankie Montas might pitch two games and that's it. And, and if so, I don't really have an issue with that. I say, hey, they gave it a shot. It didn't work out. You still have a lot of depth. Um, and, and, and but you know, like the the flip side is he could be really he could be great, and and you could be getting the absolute bargain. We just we really don't know at all uh, how many innings to project him next year. Yeah, I'd be fine to trade. You know, I'm I'm not against trading prospects at all, especially with um, you know trading a starting pitching prospect like. I keep going back and forth because of the thing I just said about how expensive they're getting and how much control. But like, if it truly was for like a legit ace type or you know somebody of that caliber, you can put in that top bucket, which I've talked about before. Like, I'd be okay with it. I wouldn't be upset at all. Now, do I think they have to absolutely do it? Fail if they don't? No. But I don't have a prop a you know a problem with it. And maybe that's something that. You know, deadline comes. We're talking about a different team, right? How many guys on this list are going to be healthy at the deadline? Probably not all of them, right? Like, that's baseball. It does not mean this is your final roster on December 30th. It doesn't mean it's your final roster on, at spring training. We can just see how it goes and reevaluate. We'll probably think totally different of these prospects come July than we do right now. Like we'll just have more information, more data, more um, fil- or you know, uh, fo- footage on them or whatever I'm trying to say. So um, yeah, I mean, we don't have to make claims on playoff, not playoff, terrible off season or anything today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, Clay, let's kind of talk a little bit about the bullpen because uh, the bullpen's deep right now. Um, you know, when I was putting together this depth chart, I had to put Alex Young and TJ Antone out just because Buck Farmer obviously is is pretty much guaranteed a spot. They just signed him to a major league deal. Nick Martinez is for sure going to be in there. Sam Mole, Pagan, Sims, Diaz. I'm pretty confident Jabot and Cruz are there the way they pitched. Um, so, again, I think Alex Young probably ends up getting in there because, again, you only need one of those guys to be hurt. And, and it just that that's the nature of the beast with pitchers. Good chance TJ Anton gets there. Um, Daniel Duarte probably becomes a lot of that that same same guy like he was last year, where he kind of goes back and forth. But uh, this bullpen, you know, I mean, you are asking a lot of guys to repeat. Um, that 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 it, there there might be some challenges, but you have the depth maybe to with, withstand that. That's the thing. We know it's a coin flip when it comes to the bullpen, and that's why you and I have always talked about this now for years that we don't stress out too much about the bullpen right now. Because you know once it comes around, there'll be a random guy who does well. The David Hernandez uh, comes in and pitches well. Then the next year, he's terrible, right? Like, that just happens. There's ups and downs, inconsistency. That's why they were moved from starters to a bullpen at some point in their career. You have established at least a couple of guys right now, and you know what's going to happen. They're going to bring in waiver guys. They're going to bring in spring training invites. We see it every year. Hell, there's a few on this list, right? I mean, Buck Farmer was kind of that, you know, give him another chance type. Ian Jabo was to Fernando Cruz kind of popped up out of nowhere. Like Alex Young, like those are all within the past year, year and a half or whatever. So in reality, like this will change. It's going to be easier to find bullpen help, especially at the deadline. If, if they get to that. So I don't worry too much right now. You have some experience depth, which is better than just saying, you know, Levi stout and you know, we're going to roll with that. (laughs) Yeah. So the, the buck farmer signing this, this past week to me kind of made me feel like that's probably it for the bull, but I don't think they're going to make another, major league signing if you're signing buck farmer to a major league deal that feels like that's your your end piece right did you kind of feel the same way yeah yeah it did feel that way and um all you have to do is look around at other bullpens on successful teams and i know we've said this year before just see how many names you actually know see how many guys have been on that team the entire season or multiple seasons like it's going to change so much um you're gonna have players in the minors that pop up and you know, are able to come up and maybe the, maybe some of them click. Alexis Diaz was kind of a, you know, keep your eye on this guy type, but wasn't a 
for sure thing noted name two years ago in December. We had talked about him on the show a little a little bit more in passing, but there's going to be players that pop up. It's the area of the team that I worry about the least, especially at this point in the season, just because I know there's going to be changes. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get to some questions. We got some questions on Twitter from on at Chatterbox Sports. If you have any other questions, put them in the chat. I just saw a lot of uh, uh, fun banter. I didn't see any real questions. So if there is any, fire them again. Um, let's see. What else did we get here, Clay? Uh, the first question comes from Reds Fan Man. Are you worried about the team? which didn't have enough starters in 2023, having too many options in 2024. Says that answer seems obvious, but worth reiterating, you can trade away any starters for nothing because there's too many. I say keep them because your starting options have options. You can send them to AAA. Um, I mean, we even saw the Texas Rangers go in with six legitimate proven starters last year into spring training and not guys that you would really send to the minors. Like you're going to need them. These guys have options. So it's a good place to be in. Yeah. I mean, I would even say, you know, I I'm pretty content with where the reds are um, uh, starting pitching wise. Um, but uh, if a guy like Jordan Montgomery falls in your lap and you can make it happen. I, hey, people I might love hate that. this. People might hate this. If if Andrew Rabbit has to start the year in Triple A, so be it. Like that's good. That's what good teams do. Good teams force force you know guys that that should be in the big leagues to to pitch in we the minors until there's an injury. Seattle ended up at the end of the year with several rotation guys who started in the minors. Now they were more you know not as proven as Andrew Abbott, but um, you know it's it's okay to have these super young players start in Triple A especially at a position where every single person that's signing, we talk about injuries like that is how common it is. I would not be surprised if it's 50% of pitchers miss some variation of time to due to injury. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there's going to be any other, other moves. And that kind of goes right in the next question from diehard reds. Do you think this is likely the last major addition this off season? Um, he thinks they, there might be a right-handed outfielder, but thinks their work's li likely done. I mean, if someone falls in the Reds lap, maybe, um, I wouldn't put it past like, like, you know, crawl and, and, and meter to, you know, pull off some sort of trade and then look to sign someone. I, I just, I, I, I don't, I think it's more unlikely than not that there's another major league signing. Uh, but I, I wouldn't put it past them if things kind of fall the Reds way, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you know, a lot of these signings, there was no rumors about it. There was no rumblings, and here's what I'm hearing, sources. Like, there wasn't any of that. It's so, like, who knows? Tomorrow they could just go out and sign some, you know, Tiosca Hernandez or whoever, you know, you want on your own personal list, and we just haven't heard about it. Um, I, I know someone just said about growing pitching and acquire hitters. Um, the reason why I think trading, yeah, I, I want to grow pitchers, don't get me wrong. Um, it's just harder to sign pitchers to Great American Ballpark. So if you're in need for a certain type of pitcher, I think it's easier to trade for them, for that specifically. Now, of course, you know, I say that on the day Frankie Montauk signs with the Reds, so it sounds a little backwards. But historically speaking, you were not going to be landing a lot of pitchers via free agency with super, super high-end stuff, right? Yeah. Someone asked for the stats for Montas. I'll put them up here on the screen for you. Um, I mean, last year only threw uh, one in the third innings. He threw on September 30th last year, made a comeback yeah. kind of at the end of the year, coming back off shoulder surgery. Uh, 2022 was a mixed bag. He was uh, really good with Oakland, 3.180 RA, 104 innings. Um, as mentioned, him and Luis Castillo were kind of 1A, 1B at the 2022 trade deadline. Uh, if you remember, the Yankees were one of the teams in a lot of talks for Luis Castillo. They decided to go with Montas. Clearly, they they swung and missed on that um, and, and should have you know ponied up for Castillo if they were giving away that kind of package. Um, he didn't pitch well in New York. 
Um, but it's only eight starts, such a small sample. Uh, I mean, but the, there's the parallels with him and Sonny Gray are, are, are pretty, are pretty funny though. You know, guy goes from Oakland, goes to New York struggles. And uh, here he is in Cincinnati trying to reestablish his value. Do you think that there's, I, I read this on Twitter. I'm not saying I think this, but I thought it was like at least interesting that the Yankees kind of gave him that one inning at the end, just to like say like going into the off season that, okay, he pitched at the end, like, he was healthy enough to pitch in a major league game, like just to kind of help him out. Because if you miss the entire year, like that may be a little bit different story. Now, of course, they have to have physicals, right? There's doctors that review all of this, so it may be nothing. But I thought it was at least an interesting idea. Yeah, well, I'm sure the guy, you know, worked hard and all that kind of stuff. The Yankees were well out of it. So, um, and, you know, it was just kind of one of those, I guess, things. Hey, he did it, he came back. I'm sure it was more for him. I'm sure the Yankees at the end, whether they treated him well at the end or not, I'm not saying they didn't, but I'm sure the Yankees weren't thrilled with, with what they got out of him uh, for what they gave up for a year and a half. And I mean, look, injuries happen with pitchers. Uh, Frankie Montas, it's funny. Frankie Montas is exactly why I don't want to go trade for Dylan Cease. <laughs> like, because uh, like what happened with him is like, Frankie Montas was was thought of like Dylan Ceases right now, right? Am I off on that? No, no. I think that for whatever reason, um, it's it's probably just, you know, Montas being an Oakland West Coast team that's not being, you know, historically like followed very well in the past couple of years. Like that probably just you know, people didn't seem in the same light as Cease. He's not as sexy of, you know, a pitcher or whatnot. But no, you're right. And that trade that they traded. For Montas at the time looked like a whole lot. And like, <laughs> it's another case of just like the A's kind of losing trades, even when they get back good prospects. Like, very few of those guys are looking good right now. Yeah. That's exactly what you want. You, you don't you don't make the trade for the, the pitcher. You, just, you wait for them. They come to you. You sign them. They try to establish their value now. The, this, this worked out perfectly in this sense for, uh, for the Reds. All right. A couple more questions we had in here. Um, I believe I saw Twitter or X.com is now integrating comments when we're on this platform, which is uh, when it's just me, when I don't have Trace. Um, so I think if you ask a question on Twitter directly in that chat, it is coming through to us. So uh, we'll see. What are the odds? This is from Noah. Noah Abney. What are the odds we see one of our odd men out? Brandon Williamson or Connor Phillips find a role in a bullpen as a long relief or otherwise. This is a great question from Noah. I'll start. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I, I think they're going to want Williamson and Phillips to be a starter as long as possible. I actually think that Nick Martinez signing was to help that not become necessary. Um, again, I'm not saying it, it's impossible. And, and maybe, you know, um, especially like like early in the year, if there's like a, a, a stretch where you only need four stars and they have an off day, maybe they do kind of have one of them. They throw them to pull the pen for a little bit. Um, but I, I don't think I see it happening long term. I think the Reds view that as more of like a, a last resort type thing. No, I, I completely agree. All right. Do you think Roger asked, do you think the Monta signing puts Ashcraft or Williams in the bullpen? Yeah, sorry. Same question. No, I, I don't think so. Scott asked the question, what is the ceiling for Montas? He's been over a hundred innings twice in his career and is coming off a lost season injury. Um, I mean, I think the, the ceiling's very, very high, but the the floor is very, very low. I mean, the floor is he does a pitch. Like I mean, the floor is he just literally doesn't pitch the shoulder you know, becomes an issue and that's it. And, uh, you know, thanks yeah, for, I mean, I, thanks I, for I, coming to spring training. Uh, thanks for giving a shot. Uh, good luck to you, Frankie. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's going to be pitching in great American ballpark a lot too. So, you know, just keep that in mind, you know, when you're looking at his overall of numbers, if you're comparing them directly to previous years and think, Oh no, he's not as good. Like, um, like you said, the seal or the, the floor is, we don't even remember this happened. You know what I mean? And, and and the ceiling could be one of your top guys in the rotation. I mean, he has that type of stuff and that type of a pitch mix to get there. Um, it's it's just going to come down to help, and we'll just have to wait and see on that. 
have they officially announced it yet? By the way, like no, they haven't. The they haven't. We're we're gonna do this whole show, and it's he's gonna fail the physical. Yeah, like, that well, that was my next like thing is like, I you know ninety nine percent of the time those just go through no problem. But, like it's not impossible. Not that yeah, I'm hoping I mean, for that. I want Frankie Montas. Don't 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 get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, not even it gets to this point, you know enough of the medicals or whatnot that that you're you're good. But it's uh, it's um, it's possible. I saw another question here. Oh, where'd it go? You guys are just commenting so much. I can't, I can't keep up. And no, I appreciate appreciate everyone who watches watches this uh, this silly show. Oh, John, I ask your opinions of only having one single lefty in the pen. Again, I do think Alex Young gets into the major league pen. I just put him out because there was no one else when I when I put this list here together that I could pull out. But again, one of those guys are going to get hurt. I mean, the Reds last year honestly had an incredible year in terms of health for their bullpen. Not as much with the starters, but the fact that like like Lucas Sims stayed healthy almost the whole year. And he has, that has not had a good track for that. Jabot farmer, these guys, they were healthy almost all year. That's pretty rare with relievers. You see them, you see these guys going on the IL every other week yeah. and most, most teams. So I do think there's two, I don't necessarily think like, and, and I don't like I think Alex Young is a bona fide great reliever. I think he's perfectly fine and serviceable, but I just don't think in today's game, you necessarily need to have like, two great lefty relievers just because with a three batter minimum it just kind of makes yeah. it tough to really use lefties in a lot of big spots and there have not been a lot of lefties come off the market i mean tim hill just was signed by the white Sox for i think 1.8 million dollars or something but for whatever reason like a lot of these kind of alex young types or even a little bit higher level than him lefty bullpen pieces aren't even signed yet. And I bet you they bring three in on non-roster invites of some kind. And, you know, you'll kind of, kind of just see where it goes from there. Yeah. The Reds, this is a good question from Sean. The Reds will need to clear a spot on the 40 man roster. If Frankie passes his physical and signs me and uh, Claire actually in a little, uh, little side uh, group chat. And we were talking about this because Every time the Reds have added a spot, I've heard people say, oh, they're going to take out the 40-man roster. And I'm like, TJ Hopkins is on the 40-man roster. There's fine. There's plenty of room. They're actually, the Reds have filled up this 40-man to where it's, uh, it, it's. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say every player on there is, is you know, um, the greatest thing ever. But whoever you, 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 you DFA is probably going to hurt a little bit. I think, Clay, did you think Barrera was the most likely? I no, I... I still think, and I, I actually tweeted, so when they signed Connor Capel a, a few days ago, my first thought was actually, like, this is the Nick Martini DFA gets claimed replacement. Like, he can be the depth there. I think Nick Martini could get DFA'd, and I actually don't know if he would get claimed, honestly. I mean, he's kind of a org depth guy throughout his career. Flashed last year. But I mean, this guy's coming up on, what, 33 years old, like, if you lose the 33-year-old or depth guy who played well for his stint last year, that's okay. You have Connor Cable, who's a, a maybe a better – I I don't know if he's better, but he's a similar type of player, right? Um, so I, I, I think that was like a signing knowing we may have to DFA Nick Martini. And, you know, if it comes down – because right now you have quite a few, like, outfield options. And if they still plan on – you know, let's just say adding another outfielder is in their plans this offseason, then like Martini's the easy answer for me. Unless yeah, you want to trade Jose Barrero for some type of a flyer prospect that's not on the 40 man. I, I think yeah, I think you're holding on to Barrero unless you get a trade partner. Even if it's not much, I think you you want to hold on to him until you have to make that decision. Because you don't yeah. have to make that decision until March, whatever the day before two days before opening day, right? I mean, you can hold him that long. Um, he gives you good depth, and you never know. You never know what will happen in spring training. You may, unfortunately, have a bunch of injuries and be like, hey, nice to have Jose Barrero here who we can plug in and, and keep keep along. And, um, you know, he's, he's a guy that, that that can't quit. I, man, I, I like Martini. I just, I, I, I liked him. Um I do think he's got the potential to be a decent like platoon hitter that could kind of, you know, be a, a solid lefty. 
Um, but he's probably this, just this like, well, I mean, you know, he was DFA'd a few years ago, right? Yeah, that's yeah, so, yeah. Hey, why not do it again and maybe he'll come around for a third time? Yeah. Uh, AJ Worse asks, what are the contract stipulations if he doesn't pitch? Does he collect all 16 million? Yep, he gets it all. I mean, usually when they announce these contracts, it's they're making this much money. And if there's any sort of stipulation, it's the next sentence. So if they say it's a $16 million contract, that's guaranteed. Um, it just gets the whole shebang. But look, I think that's that's the going rate for a lottery, a really good lottery ticket, which is honestly, I think, probably what Frankie Montas is. And- and it's a fair price. Um, the reason why I thought the Reds may have overpaid was simply because he chose to come here as opposed to somewhere else that may be a better fit for, you know, just pit, you know, a better environment for pitching. Um, but yeah, when you get paid on the open market, it's because you could do something that other pitchers can't do. Rather be throw 100 miles an hour, throw a, a, a great curveball, or be Kyle Gibson and just simply stay healthy. And eat innings. Like he got paid eleven million because he's available more often than the common pitcher, and he got paid for that. We've seen Jordan Lyles get paid tens of millions of dollars to have a six ERA just because he can go out there and eat up innings. Like so, there's different reasons why you get paid when it comes to to pitching, but six, sixteen that could end up looking like a steal. It, re- it really truly could. Like I, I think he's good enough to make that look like a steal if it clicks. Yeah, I just I don't really think the Reds were in a position where they needed an inning eater. I think they have enough yeah. guys. I mean, I think like Carson Spires could be an inning eater. Like he's probably going to be as decent as you know a lot of the guys that are just your average pitchers. I think look, take a shot, get a guy with some real legitimate bona fide upside. Um, and I think Matas has that. Super chat from Ryan Carroll. What do you think about Michael A. Taylor? He's a perfect fit, great defender, true center fielder, hits lefties well, won't cost much. Clay, you got any, any thoughts first? Yeah, he was with Kansas City before and was you know hitting well, and then um, I, I think he was traded over to the Twins last year. And he is a really good defender. He still has a ton of speed. He can play um, center, left, right, wherever you want to put him. Um I don't love his bat, but those things I just mentioned do get players paid. And like he is stuck around forever because of that. Like I, I would not be upset with that signing. It just depends on like what are your expectations for filling that role. Like I, I would rather go after a better offensive piece than Michael A. Taylor. But that would make sense because they kind of need a backup center fielder. And they Kind of need somebody in case you know Friedel does, you know, d- doesn't hit as well. Even though I think he will, um, I'm a little bit worried about that backup center fielder role. And I know Nick's probably gonna be like Jose Barrero is in center field in the backup role and whatnot. But uh, Blake Dunn, I mean Blake Dunn just may be. I, I'd rather just roll with Blake Dunn honestly at that point than go out and sign Michael A. Taylor and feel like you have to keep him around. Now you're missing the wrong guy, Stuart Fairchild, baby. I, I'm a Fairchild believer. I, I think he could play center field well enough at Great American Ballpark. Um, I just, I just I look at Michael A. Taylor and I just think I think Stuart Fairchild's got more upside. Yeah, I I think Fairchild's fine. Like I I don't know why it just feels like to me, and this is just my own personal thing. You know, I, I I'm wrong often, so this would not be a surprise. But it just feels like they're willing to upgrade from Stuart Fairchild like it wouldn't be that hard of a decision to make so if they now in an ideal world you go out you sign you trade whatever it is like you bring in like a bona fide right-handed hitting outfielder we're all happy they've upgraded the depths now upgraded all live one as well but if they don't do that like Stuart Fairchild um Blake Dunn whoever you want to invite to spring training, somebody else that we haven't thought of who's going to skyrocket, you know, even like Reese Hines out, outside chance, in my opinion, it's just like right-handed outfielder who could help out in those scenarios. All work. Fairchild's got a cry career. Way to runs created plus, and it's not close. Um, 
What was your favorite? This is from our good pal, Reds fan, Brandon. What was your favorite Bubba Thompson memory? My favorite Bubba Thompson memory was that people saw that signing and wanted to talk about it. And I was like, I, I think this guy is just, he's filling the fill in a spot. And I, I think I said at the time, it was highly unlikely he ever plays a game for the Reds. Usually, and I'm, I know about him and like knew his name and stuff just because like at one time he was a prospect, like uber fast, like can play center field, you know, everyone like that kind of like gets intrigued. And when the Reds got him, like I I really don't want to sound negative. Like I immediately thought this guy's gonna be DFA before spring yep. training. Like he is here because he was on a waiver, and if everything else goes wrong, like there's Bubba Thompson. So I thought this poor guy is never going to be on the Reds. Like, I doubt he even, like, do, do you think he owns any Reds gear? I Well, I guess he went he, to Reds Fest, so he's got was some. Was he at Reds Fest? Hey, at least, at, least they, at least they brought him to Reds Fest, yeah. you know, made him a part. Um, yeah. That, there we go. All right, Clay, any other final parting words of wisdom? You know, the Reds have spent money this this year, and they've spent money, and they've improved, and it's not just um, paying five million for a backup catcher and calling that spending money. They have got players who have started in ro- you know rotations for multiple years. They've got players who are sought after. They have st- a starting third baseman from the past few years. Like they've spent money on proven talent, and I think that we should celebrate that. Um, we don't have to be over the moon about every single signing, but the fact that they're spending money, the fact that they're trying to put together a competitive team is really exciting for me. I'm thrilled for the season. I'm thrilled for the next move, whatever that may be. And, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here in late December, excited for spring training, man. I watched major league this week. I watched million dollar arm, which I had never seen. Actually. Um, I put out a list of 52 baseball movies. If anybody needs suggestions, I'll be more than happy to, to chat baseball movies anytime. But yeah, I mean, it's starting for me. Like I'm all in. Well said. Yeah. I think collect, I think what the Reds did, I think if you look at any of the moves individually, I don't think any of them are like, wow, that's a huge splash move. But I think collectively what they did is they, they really filled the needs and you've gotten three quality major league pitchers. Um, One of them comes with a high injury risk, but also has a very, very high ceiling. Um, and, and you've got a, a player in Jamer Candelario that I think really can make the offense better. You got four players that I think collectively really make this team quite a bit better. And the Reds needed to improve. Um, I know our guy, uh, Chris Hall was talking about, look, the Reds did have a lot of things that went right in 2023. So they need a lot of things to go right again in 2024. Um, and, and I think they've, they've added players that, that are going to prove that. I think naturally you're hoping this, you know, green and, Lodolo, you get a little bit better health, but uh, but yeah, I'm excited too. Don't don't sleep on Hunter Green. Don't sleep on Hunter Green. I know everyone wants the ace. He is the ace, folks, and uh, he's gonna show it in 2024. I can't wait. Clay, it's been a pleasure, brother. Uh, we'll have to do this again soon. Um, we'll be back some time point next week with Chatterbox Reds first of the year. Um, I do start full time with Chatterbox on Tuesday, so. Uh, we we fitting some more content your way. David Bell interview coming on Tuesday next week. So look out for that. And then, of course, check out all the other shows. Uh, uh, we got uh, Bengals Film Room um, with Coach Kyle Kasky. Actually got a preview of the game tomorrow. So that's up here on the Chatterbox YouTube uh, page. Be sure to check that out. Chatterbox Bearcats with our guy Charlie Walter. Um, they're, they're going live after every game. I know they start Big 12 play coming up. Um, And then all kinds of stuff, of course, off the bench. So uh, we'll have a safe, have a great new year. Uh, We will talk again uh, probably in 2024. But you know what? With this Nick Crawl guy, you never know what will happen. So uh, if news breaks, we'll always be here. But have a good one, everyone. Go Reds.